Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Matt Ewalt. I'm the Texas Tribune's Senior Director of Events and Live Journalism. Welcome to those joining us in person here in Houston and online for today's day-long program, We the Texans, a Symposium on the State of Democracy. Texas is both central to America's democracy and emblematic of its challenges and divisions. In the 2020 election, Texas ranked last in voter turnout and other measures of civic engagement show a flagging faith in our institutions and symptoms, systems. Excuse me. In response, the Texas Tribune has set out to understand the people and processes that uphold our state's democracy and how Texas institutions can more effectively work on behalf of the state's residents. During today's symposium, we've convened a diverse group of Texans and experts in multiple fields to discuss the state of democracy in Texas, what can be done to reinvigorate trust and encourage civic engagement, and how we can work together to solve challenges on local, regional, and statewide levels. Today's event is part of the Texas Tribune's year-long We the Texans project which focuses on engaging Texans across the state on how they engage with government and feel empowered to make a difference in their communities. Here to tell us more about the We the Texans project and welcome us is Tribune Editor-in-Chief Sewell Chan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for showing up on a Tuesday morning to talk about something as serious as democracy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of news and the, where the Texas Tribune sees itself. First of all, a quick show of hands. How many of you, when you think about the news or reading the news, watching the news, listening to news, feel a little depressed? How many, how many of you sometimes feel a little overwhelmed? How many of you have started even sometimes avoiding the news? Because it's just stress that we may not need right now. Uh, you're not alone. And uh, I'm a lifelong journalist. Uh, this is my 25th year in journalism. And I came to Texas and to the Tribune specifically because I believe deeply that our model of free public service journalism, and for us that means no opinion journalism. We are all facts, all stories. Um, for me, that model is crucial to rebuilding an information ecosystem in America. So when we thought about our approach to 2024, an election year that is dominated by you know which two people, we decided to take a very different approach. Because when people think about the news or they think about political news or democracy, they tend to think about, you know, cable news. They think about Congress, the presidency. Democracies actually lived at a much more local level. And if, as a Texas news organization, if we're not going to communities and families and talking to real people about what democracy means to them, then we're not doing our jobs. So that was the incentive, behind, that's the motivation behind We the Texans, that instead of taking a top-down approach to looking at what's going on with democracy in Texas, we're looking at the grassroots, we're looking at things from the bottom up, and that yields journalism that is more um, responsive to the everyday needs and concerns of actual people, who I'm pretty sure are everywhere, worried about regular people issues. How am I gonna pay the bills? Can my kid afford uh, college? Um, how, what, what's the quality of the schools we're getting? What's the quality of the roads outside? And these are fundamentally not partisan questions. We've all heard the famous phrase from Tip O'Neill, all politics is local. And I'm sure you've all heard the new mantra that no, it's the other way around now. All politics is national. And that's partly because of television, the internet, social media. There is such a temptation to reduce everything to one side or the other. Um, Republican versus Democrat, left versus right, et cetera. And I think it's, we can all agree, it's actually, not only is it kind of potentially harming our society, but it doesn't really reflect democracy as it's lived on the ground. So throughout this year, we're doing listening sessions across Texas. Our first one was in Tyler. We're doing events like this that help to convene thought leaders, speakers, writers, uh, policymakers. And we're also doing a year-long series of journalism that is looking at democracy from the level of the grassroots. Our first story was about a town, at the town of Gunter in North Texas. This was a town where recently everyone stepped down from the city council, uh, everyone. And we were like, why? And I urge you to read the story because it is really, there's not a political party mentioned in it because it's ultimately not about the parties, it's about trust 
and how trust gets eroded at the local level. One final story. I was recently in Texarkana talking to a county judge um, from a rural uh, county near Texarkana, Cass County. And this judge was telling me, and it's a very conservative community, obviously. This judge was telling me that half of his time is just spent trying to get truthful information out there because there's so many rumors and misinformation. This is in rural Texas. So this is not an area where there's a lot of, frankly, culture wars or people, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, this conservative community. But he said that people come up to him and they've just come from watching the television. They're like, Judge, I am so furious. And he's like, what are you furious about? And they talk about all the stuff they're seeing from TV, the migrants, the, and he's like, are your streets clean? Are our schools safe? Do you feel safe in our community? And then once they realize that like, it's brought back to the local, they're like, well, maybe things aren't so bad. And I would argue that there are communities like that across America, both red and blue, conservative and liberal, where if we just bring the conversation down to the level where people's lives are actually affected, maybe they may not be as, the things may not be as bad as we see on television. So I leave you with that thought, and I really welcome your participation in this event. We're going to hear from an amazing lineup of speakers. I see them ready. And so without further ado, our first panel. I still have more things to say. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. I just have a little bit more running, quickly running through uh, our day before we get to, uh, get to our, our panel. So today's program runs through 4 p.m. today, five panel conversations and facilitated conversation this afternoon to close the day. You can follow along with our printed program. And just please note, we do have a few additional panelists uh, joining us today not reflected in that program. We'll break for lunch at 12.15 and reconvene at 1. And note that we want to keep the conversation going. So won't otherwise be taking breaks between our panels. We also want to prioritize hearing from all of you. And we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A uh, at the mics here in Houston and online through our Q&A portal. So for those watching online at texastribune.org slash ask. I want to acknowledge uh, support from our sponsors for today's symposium. Our major sponsors are Common Cause of Texas and Methodist Healthcare Ministries. Our foundation sponsor is the Henry Luce Foundation. And though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite this event, they play no role in determining the content, speakers, or line of questioning. We're also thankful to our hosts, University of Houston Downtown and the University of Houston Hobby School of Public Affairs. We will have UH Downtown President uh, Lauren Blanchard offer a few words of welcome later today. And you'll see a couple of them in uh, red shirts here. Um, several hobby school students are going to play an important role of our program later this afternoon. And on behalf of my Tribune colleagues, I also want to thank all of those here in Houston and throughout the state who support the impactful journalism of the Tribune, including public events like these, by becoming members. And to learn more and to become a member, visit texastribune.org support. And so without our further ado, let's welcome our first panel to the stage. And so that they can get right to the conversation, I'll go ahead with bios as you all are getting settled. Um, Michael Lee serves as senior counsel for the Brennan Center for Justice's Democracy Program, where his work focuses on redistricting, voting rights, and elections. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Lee practiced law at Baker Botts LLP in Dallas for 10 years. He's a regular writer and commentator on election law issues on television, in print, and online. William McKenzie is a senior editor, uh, editorial advisor at the George W. Bush Institute, where he is working on editorial projects on democracy and freedom and education reform. He previously served as founding editor of The Catalyst, a journal of ideas from the Bush Institute, a Fort Worth native, he has also served 22 years as an editorial columnist for the Dallas Morning News and led the newspaper's Texas Faith blog. Neilan Parker is the inaugural executive director of Common Ground USA and a leader in identifying solutions to polarization and political violence in America. Before joining Search for Common Ground, Parker founded and co-directed the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton University, where she helped to create the first near real-time national database of political violence in the United States. 
and our moderator, Lisa Falkenberg, and is the Houston Chronicle's vice president and editor of Opinion, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who has covered Texas for more than 20 years. Falkenberg leads the editorial board and the paper's opinion and outlook sections, including letters, op-eds, and essays. As opinion editor, she led the editorial board to its first Pulitzer in 2022 for a series of editorials titled The Big Lie, exploring how Texas has employed the myth of voter fraud for more than a century to suppress voting and control access to the polls. With that, I will turn the program over to Lisa for our opening panel, American Democracy, Our Fractured Moment. My children would tell you I talk loud enough without that, but okay. Um, you know, sometimes we hear things aren't quite so bad because remember that time we had a civil war. So I guess I'd like to start with trying to gauge where we are. Is there a way that you measure the polarization and the division, whether within our own history or comparing to other countries, Neelan? Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's wonderful to be back in the great state of Texas. My family are Texan, and uh, we have a mug that says you should never ask somebody if they are Texan, because if they are, they'll tell you, and if they're not, you don't want to embarrass them. So um, I am very, very grateful to be back here. Um, and I think that Texas has a lot, uh, a lot to show us and a lot uh, for the country to learn from. So to your question of how do you measure polarization, um, it's a little bit for me that you look in different quadrants. It's not that terrible things are going to happen or no terrible things are going to happen. In fact, terrible things happen along the way. And the question is, do you have the resilience to respond to those. And uh, a group of organizations that worked in countries at war around the world all got together and said, what is it that makes, uh, that makes a difference? It turns out in 2021, the United States was the most worsened country on the, uh, on the international measure of fragile states. So it is not the case that the United States is at the bottom of the barrel of fragility but it was the most worsened country in 2021. And what they're looking at is not how powerful you are, they're looking again at how resilient you are. How likely are you to be able to bounce back from something bad happening, like a pandemic, uh, like war? And uh, we look at different buckets. One of them is do people feel like they have agency? to be able to solve the problems that are most closely important to them. The second is that, that piece of polarization. So do people feel not only that they are different from each other, but actually that, they, that the other person hates them or is evil? Uh, the third is do people feel like they are connected to institutions and governance, and do they feel like they work? Do we believe our elections work? Do we believe our governance works? Do we believe that our security sector works for us? And if people don't feel that way, they're, they're more likely to, to feel like it's justified or even necessary uh, to, to use violence. Um, so in addition to agency and polarization, uh, and this, this institutional connection, we also look at the connection to how money flows. And the, the example that I, that I often give is how much money over the next year is going to go into campaigning to remind us what we don't share, how different we are from each other and how dangerous that is for us, versus how much money is going to go into public service announcements or various other ways to remind us that the majority of everyone in this state and in this country actually do share values and are good people and want to uh, believe deeply that we need to work together to solve our problems. So by, by all of those measures, we are, uh, we're, we're, we're taking a hit. But in terms of my optimism, I've spent about 15 years working in countries at war. And the thing that gives me pause here is not where we are, it's the direction that we're facing. But our future is not written, and we have many more opportunities than almost anywhere else I've been 
to face a different direction and to write that future in a different way. And how we got here is, of course, a long road. Um, you know, we could go back to the civil rights movement and LBJ. Um, but Bill, I guess when you think about where we are today, what do you think were the major factors? Well, uh, good morning and thank you for having us here today. Um, you know, I will say one thing, uh, listening to Neil and talk, and then I'll get to your question. I also think back uh, to the 1960s uh, and early 70s, and you think back within a 10-year period, 11-year period, we had one president assassinated, a civil rights leader assassinated, uh, a candidate uh, assassinated, we had George Wallace shot, uh, we had Nixon resign, uh, we had countercultural movements, we had uh, civil rights marches going on. There was a lot going on in the country and is very uh, turbulent in some ways. So we did get through that period and we didn't get through it by just hoping we would get through it, but we did, we did get through it. So there's, I just want to recall that more recent history where at times it was, you know, for those who lived through it, it, it could be pretty bleak at moments. Uh, to get to where we are today, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of it has to do with, uh, we were talking, Neil and I were talking about this before, I think some that people, uh, particularly younger people, are not used to seeing uh, the political parties working together uh, towards some common good. And by working together, I don't mean a love fest. I, I don't mean something that is uh, uh, easily done. But you think back about the Social Security compromise that was reached in 1983, where both parties really came to the table. They, you know, It was a fierce debate, but they did come up with a plan to save Social Security, which has lasted up until now. Uh, so I think for a lot of younger people who may not uh, may, may, I don't know if the word is not have hope, but they're skeptical about the future. They haven't seen a period where uh, the system worked well enough. That's one thing. And what happened there in Washington? I mean, was it, you know, Newt Gingrich, I've seen him blamed, and the wedge issues. Was it, I think everybody started to go home on weekends instead of <laughs> hanging out in Washington and having relationships with other humans who may not share your party uh, label. What happened in Washington? Because that affects what, what's happening here at home as well. Well, let me just comment on that one that you mentioned about members of Congress perhaps commuting back and forth. And I forgot exactly when that started, when... Uh, Votes were taken more on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and members would go back home. Uh, that certainly played a role in where people, you know, didn't live in Washington. Their kids didn't go to school together. Uh, they didn't know each other in the same way uh, that they may have uh, back before the votes were, were, when people went back home on Mondays and, and uh, went back home on Fridays and came back on Monday nights. So I think that did uh, contribute Part of it, I mean, obviously, gerrymandering is something that uh, tends to reward the most faithful uh, members of parties. Um, those are two things. And so you mentioned gerrymandering. Uh, Michael, your blog was such a uh, guide to me, a help to me when I was trying to understand the issue as a, as a reporter. Um, you and John Oliver, of course. Uh, if you haven't seen that, <laughs> John Oliver's on, on redistricting, it's great. Um, so redistricting is always, you know, gerrymandering has been around for a long time. How did we get to the point where, you know, it's not just a salamander, but it's a computerized, all-knowing salamander that manages to do this, this thing with such a precision that we have perverted our democracy? Well, that, that's, a, that's a long question, <laughs> but um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that um, gerrymandering is something that has long been a problem in American democracy, but in a lot of ways it is getting worse because you can draw maps with greater precision because you do it with data about voters, right? It used to be you were taking guesses about 
how maps would perform over the course of a decade, and you often got it wrong, right? And, and maps would work for an election cycle or two, but then they would be out of date, and you were just trying to get a, a, a little bit of an advantage. But now, because you have really sophisticated data based on what people view on social media, what they buy, and things like that, you can construct models just as you do for voters to determine um, who, who should go where, and you can draw maps that stick for the whole of the decade. And you know, North Carolina is a prime example where they had a map, a couple of maps last decade that were both 10, three, 10 Republicans and three Democrats in a state that's pretty close to, to 50-50. And, you know, I think, you know, but related to that, I mean, so there's, there's the imbalance problem, but related to that has been, especially this cycle, um, and including here in Texas, you know, a determined effort to reduce competition. And um, you do that by, like in, in North Texas, parts of Denton County, which are part of suburban Dallas, are drawn into a district all the way to the Texas panhandle, to the New Mexico border. Um, and, you know, the, the decrease in competition really um, has helped drive um, polarization. Now, you won't have competition everywhere. I live in Brooklyn, New York, where you can't really draw a Republican district if your life depended on it, and there are similarly places where you can't draw a Democratic district. But 55% of Americans live in the suburbs, um, and Texas is especially suburban. And you would think, you know, if you think about the suburbs, these increasingly diverse um, suburbs, you know, ethnically, politically, um, and if you look at a political map, the suburbs are light blue, light pink, purplish. You would think that you would have a lot of competition in the suburbs of Dallas and Houston and Atlanta, um, but you just don't. And that's because of the way that maps are are very carefully drawn. Um, you know, I went back and looked in 1998 that there were about 186 of the House seats and in the House seats in the U.S. House that were toss-ups, 186 out of 435. Today, it's 25, um, and there's zero in Texas, which you know is, is incredible because Texas should be one of the most competitive states. Recently, it was, um, but you know because of the way that maps are drawn, there there is no competition, and everything gets decided in the primary. And we know that the primary electorates of both parties. But especially in recent years, Republicans have been more, um, are, are more extreme. And really, you're catering to the, the extremist in those. And so I think, you know, overcoming that in some way, and, you know, you could get rid of gerrymandering, but you also might do things like a top four, top five primary um, where everybody votes all together and you, you have ranked choice voting to determine or some other way of determining it, or you could. Um, you know, use multi-member districts that sort of like make it sort of matter. But, you know, I, I think um, most people, when they go to vote for Congress, will not, or even for that matter, the US, for the, the, their state representative or their state senator, aren't voting in competitive races. And, and that is, um, you know, really pretty incredible, especially in a place like Texas where, again, like given where Texans live, you know, like the, the fastest growing counties in the country are, in the suburbs of places like Dallas and Houston. You would think that there would be a lot of competition and there just really isn't. And how does that affect um, voting behavior? Is there a correlation between states with lack of competition and low turnout? I, 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 yeah, I, I think that there definitely is, um, you know, because there's no effort to mobilize people. You, you saw that, um, you know, so, if you go back to the early part of this century, there was a Republican gerrymander um, after Republicans took control of the, the Texas legislature to eliminate competitive seats in places like East Texas and West Texas. And um, they did, and it was successful and it was upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, and what happened is before you had all this national money pouring into these competitive seats to do voter mobilization, right? You know, to turn out voters. And the, the voters that were being turned out didn't just vote for Congress, they voted for county commissioners and sheriffs and other people. Um, and so you had a lot of Democrats and Republicans at all levels of government. But then, you know, when there's no more competitive seats, that money goes elsewhere to where there are competitive seats. And what happened is that a lot of these county parties in, in parts of Texas sort of died on the vine. Um, and then you start to see county commissioners lose. You see um, school board people lose. You see sheriffs lose. And, um, you know, they, those, those parties really have become a shell of, of what they used to be. 
Um, and, and, you know, I think, you know, it, it absolutely sort of affects turnout. And uh, the other thing I will say is um, the fact that there is no competition, um, you know, makes it hard to, you know, mobilize new groups of, of voters, right? Because, you know, a lot of the country's increased diversity has been driven primarily by Latinos and Asians. Um, and the Latinos and Asians, at least at this point, still do not strongly identify with parties. They may vote fairly consistently for one party or the other, but they don't view themselves as Democrats or Republicans. And, you know, having done in a past life voter mobilization, you know, you talk to Latino voters and they say, oh, well, I, I love this guy. He was great on the city council. I'll vote for him at the general election. It's like, well, no, can you, there's a primary coming up. You need to vote in the primary. And what happens is people say, oh, but I'm not a Democrat. You know, even though you know that they are real, they, they will vote almost straight party Democratic in the in the general, but they don't. And so, you know, you know that, that also is an issue. So no one is engaging these new Texans, right, in, in ways that sort of get them engaged in the political process because by the time they want to be engaged in the political process in the general election, it's all over. Mm -hmm. Neelan, you were kind of shaking your head. Did you want to add something to that? Uh, I think I, I, among other things, I was agreeing with the degree to which we have a variety of different identities and uh, and they go beyond one party affiliation and even beyond the party affiliation there's voting, but I think we have a tendency, particularly around elections, to, to overemphasize that one identity as defining of all of the others and there's something a little bit self-fulfilling about doing that. So uh, engaging with people, um, uh, beyond that is often a way to uh, I, to kind of move beyond this polarized moment. I also just appreciate the way that you guys have designed this panel that brings in the elements of how do we do institutional reform and think about gerrymandering and the laws that govern what we're doing and also how do we think about how we tell our story and how do we get engaged in our own sort of social worlds around this because I think one of the things in your first question about how do we measure what's going on is you have all of these things that need to actually move together. You can't have a an election that is uh, legally done well that will succeed in a highly, highly polarized context in which there's no trust socially or societally. So, uh, you know, kudos to, to you for, for thinking about the different elements of pulling that together. I did nothing. It was all the bright people at the Texas <laughs> Tribune. <laughs> but they did do a great job. Uh, I, yes. I want to throw in a, a couple other thoughts. One is I don't want to leave the impression that nothing is getting done in Washington. And I have a, a thought about that one second. But you, you look, we continue to, this is going to be really wonky, but we continue to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary School Act, which started under, under LBJ. And that has happened under both Democratic and Republican presidents. Uh, we continue to, you know, renew the Civil Rights Act under both presidents, both parties. Uh, and, you know, you think back at, for the George W. Bush started the president's emergency plan for AIDS uh, relief in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and, you know, that has been renewed under both parties. And that was a bipartisan thing that, you know, 25 million lives have been saved through that. So things are happening. I've wondered this, um, though, that um, in the industry and the field that Lisa, that you and I spent a lot of our careers in, uh, as we see the shrinkage of Washington bureaus uh, in, in newspapers in particular, uh, you know, we may read or see less reporting, not to fault the, 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 the institutions necessarily, but we just see less reporting coming out of there uh, about things that are happening. And I think about a, a now retired Republican senator was telling me about a, a piece of legislation he is working on that was, you know, was pretty wonky, but it affected people's lives in a, a material way. And he, he uh, couldn't find anybody really in, in his state uh, that had bureaus in Washington to report on it. So you know, things like that go underreported. Uh, and it's a, a function to some degree of this challenge that the media industry is facing newspaper industry in particular. And that's a good segue. You know, what, if we're looking inward, what, what responsibility does media 
and journalis- journalism have here. We know what negativity bias is. It's something that humans apparently are evolved to have. We're just more interested in the negative. Even though we say we want positive news, those experiments fail. And um, we want negative because somewhere in our minds that's warding off some kind of threat. Um, But at the same time, it can become toxic. And it can become a warped sense of reality when you look, I'm going to say paper, I know many people don't read the paper anymore, but (laughs) when you're turning the pages and you're faced with all these headlines, this person dead, this crime rate, you know, this um, Supreme Court ruling that, you know, seems very problematic in in your own ideology. Um, It can become daunting and some people turn off. So I wonder um, what your thoughts are on that and how we can keep people engaged. Well, I will, I will start with that, uh, and, and I will confess I am one of those. I read, I read a newspaper. I read three newspapers each day, uh, but I am one of those can get worn out and am getting worn out, and I was joking to Neelan before we came up when Sewell was talking about some of this that I spent a lot more time watching ESPN today than I did before because sometimes I just can't take it. Uh, so uh, I think it... I think two things. One, I think journalism really should should focus on accuracy first, uh, getting the facts right. There was a it was either Pew or AP uh, research uh, poll that showed what does the public want. The one thing that the public wanted most of all uh, in this poll was accuracy. They wanted the facts. Was, they wanted factualism. So that's number one. Uh, continue to report the crimes, continue to report what, what's happening. Uh, we don't want uh, to, to whitewash things. But at the same time, uh, find areas where, th- where solutions are occurring, where they're happening. And, and I think we'll find a lot of that uh, in rooms like this. I'll find a lot of it at the local level. A colleague and I are working on a series at Bush on the call the pluralism challenge, looking at the conditions that give rise uh, to people being able to engage with each other across uh, various lines of division. Uh, and there are lots of examples of, of that uh, going on. But I think, you know, there's, there's also, you may be familiar with this, the Solutions Journalism Network, which is trying to focus on how communities are solving problems. Um, I work as a volunteer with a homeless ministry of my church in Dallas. We run a a writer's workshop on Friday and, and publish a street paper, which our clients who are largely homeless write for. Uh, and they have pieces that are published through a collaborative that involves the Dallas Morning News, KERA, SMU, University of North Texas. And it's all funded through this Solutions Journalism Network. What is the pathway for people who have gone from homelessness to being housed? Tell us that story. So there, there are opportunities to tell stories that um, are solution-oriented, but I'm not saying ignore the negative stuff, but balance it somehow. I think another thing is um, agency, but we can't leave people in despair. We can't leave people um, without hope. Um, There's a climate scientist, in Lubbock at, at Texas Tech who um, writes about, I guess, th- through her prism of being a, a person of faith and how to reach people who are inclined not to listen, not to be concerned about global warming or kind of to, to push it to the side. And she's able to reach people, right, through this other, uh, through the common <laughs> ground that they have in, uh, as Christians. Um, but she says, and in her book she does this, uh, we've got, in all these stories, we've got to leave people with something they can do, some kind of hope. Um, so where, where do you see that working in media? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yes, and I couldn't Catherine agree Catherine Hayhoe, for any, everybody who didn't hear that, her book is uh, Saving Us. It's, it's really great. I, I recommend it. Um, and uh, and actually a number of journalists in the Solutions Network, Amanda Ripley has done a lot of really good work. And uh, and I think that in fairness to, to journalists, there's, there's a bit of an art to it because you have to take people who are 
who are ready to hear the negative and and almost like put the broccoli in with a cake, you know. And uh, and but but at the end of it, people feel more more satisfied. So I don't know how many journalists we have in the room here, but I would say that that. Um, when you're thinking about what is what is my role here, one of the things that's very interesting to me is having been in countries at war, coming back to the United States, what is different here? And one of the things that is different is the, the degree to which in conflict zones, there's a lot of conversation about conflict sensitive journalism and the and the the the, the role that journalism plays. And there is a huge amount of, of thinking in the United States about integrity in journalism, but it has a slightly different bent to it sometimes. So conflict-sensitive journalism, one of, one of the pieces that you're talking about would be part of that. How do we make sure that when we tell a story about what's going wrong, we don't, uh, I call it reporting on the de denominator. So if something bad happens at one polling station, that doesn't actually mean that the election is fraudulent. You have to say that happened at one station, but it's not happening everywhere, so you report the denominator. The, the second piece is how do we tell the story of what can you do? Because change doesn't actually happen uh, based on the size of the problem. It's not that if you convince people that the problem is big enough that all of a sudden they will decide, oh, now, now, now I guess what? let's fix it. You know, it's Tuesday. Um, uh, it's, it's a combination of knowing how big the problem is and having some way to solve it. And the role that journalists play in offering that space for the solution is really profound. And you, and you hear the difference. You, you feel the difference when there is an article that says, here is what's happening, and here are ways that you can get involved locally, for example. Here are stories of how, here are examples to help you imagine what it might look like for this problem to be solved. Because actually that lack of imagination can be a real hindrance in, um, in, in making this possible. There are also people who are trying, so I, I think of the flip side, if you're looking for a very low barrier to entry way to get a view of the things that you might not be hearing, uh, there's a program that will send you not the straw men version of, uh, you know, you, of, of any given topic, but will send you from a conservative and a liberal perspective a view on um, the kind of like strongest version of telling the story from those two perspectives so that you have a real genuine way of seeing, well, I may not agree with this other side, but this is from, from the, that perspective, this would be the most genuine way to describe it. And even, even that, just being able to, to empathize with a perspective that you don't have can open up a set of tools and a way of solving our problems that, is, uh, that feels impossible if you are stuck in the problem itself. And, and that is um, the key, being able to respect at least the other, and, and communicating that respect. Um, it has a way of disarming, it has a way of opening a pathway, you know, between uh, two people who are, you know, in conflict. Um, I will say, as opinion editor at, at the Chronicle, one of the, the challenges is how to make, how to be passionate and not be polarizing. How to make measured, <laughs> a measured piece and a balanced piece interesting. Um, because we all want to be fiery and passionate and get people, get people's attention. And there is a time to preach to the choir. You have to rally the choir, you know, rally the troops, mix my metaphors. Uh, <laughs> but you also have to, um, you also have to persuade. I mean, I tell people we're, we're in this, we're in the persuasion business. And if you're not going to do that, then this is not the place for you. Um, so Bill, how do you how do you do that? <laughs> it's right. really hard. Oh, one quick anecdote. When I was on the editorial page of Morning News, we frequently we get calls, maybe this happens in Houston, uh, well, you all have a bias. And I thought, well, in fact, we do. That's what we do. We get paid for on the editorial page is to have an opinion or a point of view. We're trying to persuade. So that is the role of opinion pages. So this makes sure we understand the difference between opinion and, and news. I'm a big fan of David Brooks. I'm a big fan of David French. I think those are two people who would be uh, 
I don't know what you want to call them, progressive, conservative. They're kind of moderate in some, center-right. And I think they make really compelling arguments. They're really good writers. Uh, and I think it can be done. Uh, I think it takes uh, uh, a lot of practice to be able to do that. I think being informed, knowing your subject uh, is key. Uh, I, I teach journalism at SMU. I'm always telling students in this opinion writings classes, anybody can do blather. You know, you can, you can pick up the New York Times, put your finger on a story and think, okay, I'm going to spin off an editorial in 20 minutes. And you know what? It'll look like you wrote an editorial in 20 minutes, you know, that it just, I have no depth to it. So, you know, I, I guess I go back to Brooks and French. Those are two people I think they, they know their subjects generally. David French of uh, Brooks writes a lot about the social sciences and how they impact our political culture. David French had a great piece yesterday on the difference between Christian activism and Christian nationalism. People who are informed in their writings, you don't have to agree with them, um, but they can bring knowledge and informed opinion. That's kind of what you want. Um, I think one thing I stress is iron sharpens iron. Don't be afraid to go over there and encounter the arguments of the other side and contemplate them and interview people who disagree with you. I have this rule. Um, because you may come away with a changed mind. You may come away feeling even stronger than you did before, but your piece will reflect the guess the value of, of the person who's reading it who may disagree. And they say, well, this person did think it through because I see myself in here, even if the whole piece I disagree with. I want to go back to um, the issue of, of identity. <laughs> I find this fascinating because in this country, we celebrate, well, most of us celebrate our diversity. We are proud of our individual identities in a country that allows you to retain them um, while still being part of a whole. At the same time, we know, brain science tells us that if we see a common, uh, a commonality in somebody we're talking to, oh, oh, I'm talking to another mom, oh, I'm talking to another journalist, I process what they're saying in a different part of my brain. So we've got to find the common. How do you do that and still celebrate diversity and understand the importance of, of identity politics. Neela? Uh, Lisa, if I'm not mistaken, you brought your son today. Did you have to announce that? I'm sorry, I did have to announce that because I left my three children with two separate babysitters who were <laughs> slotting in last night and, uh, and despite being on a delayed flight, I finally made it here and I looked at you this morning and I said, she's getting her done. <laughs> So there are lots of identities that we have that are not politics identities. And those identities often reach our hearts and our souls in ways that bring us uh, well past that kind of interest negotiation that you might have. We may, I, I actually, I do not know many, many things about you, uh, or your politics or various things. We may disagree about a lot of things, but my initial identity that I saw there made it much easier for me to hear whatever you wanted to say about politics. I would be more open to that. That's something that we can all engage in and need, in fact, need to engage in. We, uh, but it is a slow route. So often what we think that we need to do is we need to jump in a conversation and we're gonna be brave. So we're gonna say, let's talk about politics. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you've ever done that. <laughs> oh, just one. That's, this is an amazing room. Nobody's ever done that. Um, uh, you often have to establish a relationship and a reason to trust each other, and you have to seek out some version of a shared identity before you launch into that conversation. You also have to define success of a conversation differently. And Lisa, very similar to what you were saying. If success is me convincing you to believe what I believe, you are in for some very frustrating conversations in your future. If success is learning about someone else and success is the, the path of finding the shared value underneath those different positions, you will find exactly what you said, iron against iron or 
that you yourself change, the other person may change, the experience of working together may open up possibilities that quite frankly were not on the table prior to. Neither the person you were talking to nor you were in a space to find solutions that can come from the fact if you slow it down and, and create a relationship first and then move into solving the problem, there are actually more solutions on the table as you go through that process. And the, and the strange thing is, like, I, I do think, like, that sort of conversation is actually happening in a lot of places. You know, if you go, you know, I came here and I went out to eat last night and, you know, like, there are lots of different kinds of people sitting together talking and eating and you go to, like, you know, again, like, these increasingly diverse suburbs and, and things like that and, like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the inter interracial marriage rate is, like, very high, you know, particularly for some groups. Um, but you know, and, and lo there's lots of sort of like interactions that you, you didn't have, but yet it's sort of strange when you sort of flip back into the political realm that it's very easy to polarize people, right? That it's very easy to sort of push the buttons. And, you know, I think that that is sort of a willingness of people to to push us, elected leaders and others to push us in the dark direction. And they, they you know, that's on them, you know, like, you know, but, you know, you, you know, like, you know, you go to these, like, again, these diverse suburbs, you know, like they're, it's, it's amazing, right? It's like, it looks like America, it's the future of America. And yet these are also the places where you see the greatest battles over things like um, critical race theory or trans girls in sports or other sorts of identity axes that seem remarkably easy to to push in a political way, at least among the politically engaged people. So like, you know, I do think like the country, you know, I'm optimistic about the country. I am um, a little bit more pessimistic about like the, the political dynamics of the country. You know, the country is greater than its politics um, right now. I, I would jump in with uh, one, one thing, just to add on this, uh, for this pluralism challenge series we're doing, <clears throat> we interviewed a, um, actually a colleague of mine, or fellow student of mine at the University of Texas many years ago who's now a theology professor. And his point was that if you're gonna have these kind of conversations, you're gonna enter the public square. If you do so thinking you enter with a privileged position because of your beliefs, that's one thing. But if you're gonna enter the public square considering yourself as a citizen, that's gonna lead you in a different direction. If you believe that you have this privileged position, you're more likely to try to dominate the other. Uh, if you are, entering in its citizens, you're all entering it as equals and you're trying to understand each other. And to your point, the, the goal in these kind of conversations is not necessarily to convert the other person. You're there to hear the other person. You're here to listen and they're there to listen to you. You're not necessarily there to rebut each other. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can talk about polarization and not talk about social media. Um, I'm just curious if, you know, any of you have a perspective on the on the uh, Supreme Court's hearing of, of uh, you know, t hearing the case about Texas's law um, regarding social media companies and censorship? Um, how do you think this is manipulating us? How are the algorithms helping, hurting our dialogue? Well, I, I do think, like, you know, I mean, we have to be honest and, and say, like, you know, a lot of people get their news in different ways than they did 30 or 40 years ago, right? A lot of people get their news from Facebook or YouTube or TikTok. Um, and, um, you know, there is a lot of misinformation um, in those channels or, you know, you're certainly, you know, there's a lot of selection bias, um, but there's also sort of bias because if you start clicking on one type of thing, it starts feeding you more of that one type of thing. And, you know, that can be innocuous. It could be like, oh, here's my, you know, like Italian food content, or it could be something very dark about how elections are being stolen or how you can't trust these people or how, you know, migrants are causing crime or something like that. And it's very easy. And, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, I don't know how to, you know, it's a much bigger conversation to sort of how to, how to fix that, that, environment on both social media, but then also sort of how to create a viable media environment. I'd be interested in, in whether or not this rings true for you, but I think about social media and I think about newspapers and when newspapers were newly ubiquitous in the United States and how much yellow journalism we had and how uh, 
kind of unregulated, but also and and very complicated the the newspaper was. If it was in the newspaper, it must be true. But people would buy full page ads of just full lies in them and uh, and get the message out that way. And I wonder if some of what's happening in social media is a product of the speed with which it is moving and the fact that it is new technology and that we might anticipate in the future there would be uh, some shift in that. Well, that's an interesting point because, yes, journalism did have its yellow journalism days, and then you look back uh, roughly the, you know, the earlier parts of the 20th century. Mid, um, in that period, there was a movement to try to emphasize more objectivity in journalism, uh, and to more or less, we have lived off of that legacy since then, uh, but we also had rules that apply to your Houston Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News, whatever, Texas Tribune, that um, you know you could be held responsible for the content you publish. And that means you could get sued. And I don't know about you, but it's something that we were keenly aware of that that happens. So to answer Lisa's question, I am somewhat torn. I don't, I, I personally think that that the social media companies are much closer today to being publishers than what is the uh, the, the uh, like a shopping mall. I think is the another analogy used. Where you, I think it's they're more they're closer to that. I think it was absolutely right to exempt them from liability laws back when the internet was getting going uh, back in the mid 1990s, and Congress did that. I get that. I think we're kind of at a different period now. I don't know, though, how, because they are so massive, how they do that uh, and how they're able to police their content. Facebook has an oversight advisory committee uh, that will recommend changes, my understanding is, to Facebook. Uh, on the other hand, some social media companies uh, have cut back on their, you know, content policing, I guess you would call it, their, their operations where they're trying to search out for disinformation, et cetera. So I don't know how you do that, uh, but I do think they're closer to being publishers than they were 25 or 30 years ago. So I want to make sure we're okay on time. Did we want the remainder for questions from the audience or? Oh, great. Great. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground, and, and there's a lot I didn't get to cover, but I want to hear from each of you um, on, on what gives you hope at this point. Uh, Michael, if you look at some of these reforms to redistricting, and that gives you hope, if we're looking at dialogue, if we're looking at some of the programs you've mentioned, but could you pick one thing and why you believe it's effective, starting with you, Michael? Um, well, I, I do think, you know, that Americans broadly continue to believe in our democracy. I mean, there's a lot of sort of, you know, um, poo-pooing and, 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 and a lot of sort of things that you can point to. But, you know, when you saw sort of this crisis in democracy over the last few years, um, Americans turned out to vote in record numbers. They thought the way to change things was to vote. They organized around reforms, whether it was on reproductive rights or redistricting or whatever, and, and they, where they could, got those passed through um, ballot initiatives. Um, and so, you know, people broadly do seem to, um, you know, continue to believe in democracy, because the, the answer wasn't, let's go riot. Um, but, for the most part, um, it was it was like let's go organize, let's register people to vote, let's turn people out to vote, let's you know let's let's sort of win state by state where we can. Um, you know now there are are challenges. You know um, you know forty percent of the population of the country now lives in the South. The South is by far the the country's largest region, and the South is sort of one of the hardest regions because you can't do ballot initiatives. You know there's a lot of sort of voter suppression and, and things like that here um you know but you know in, in ter overall I, I do think like you know americans still believe in in the, the the basic promise of our democracy and that that gives me hope i i always love this question first of all because i'm a, a very hopeful person i don't think you can do the work that i do and not be a fundamentally hopeful person and to see potential every day um but I also work on war, and so uh, uh, I sometimes find that my answer to this, I think, is going to be very positive and very hopeful. 
and it comes across a little dark. So uh, I'm going to try here. Um, uh, we are not in a bad place as compared to most of the places I have worked in my life. We are facing a bad direction, but that is different than having to overcome a war. It is just fundamentally different than, than having to figure out how to work out um, working together after that kind of national breakdown. So I have a lot of optimism there because I know how much worse it can be. I also know that you can get to the other side of that. And for me, common ground isn't actually civility. It isn't we can all get along and have a stasis. It is one of the most powerful tools I have ever seen in the world. The only thing that is the basis of a peace agreement that ends war of all challenges is finding that common ground. So I find hope in the fact that across this country, I see people making that effort and using that as an agent for change for the future that we want to build for all of us. Uh, and I would build on that and agree. I think what gives me hope is what's happening in a lot of local communities uh, around the country or away from the national headlines, of which there are a lot of very encouraging examples. I'll just throw out one uh, that uh, my colleague Chris Walsh and I came across as we're working on this series, uh, is the Multi-Faith Neighbors Network, which is a, a collection of, of leaders of the three major Abrahamic faiths uh, and adherents to those faiths. Uh, and they, they meet regularly uh, to try to understand each other's point of view from their each perspective. They're not there to convert each other. They're here to listen. Uh, they they have small group discussions, they share meals, they work on common projects together, which is key. Uh, and as one example, when we had uh, a hostage taking at a synagogue uh, in a Dallas suburb uh, two years ago, I think it was, and this came on the news as on a Saturday, immediately members of this local members of the Multi-Faith Neighbors Network, which is an international network, but the local members went uh, to the synagogue as this was happening, you know, to be there in solidarity uh, with the the uh, the rabbi and others who are being held hostage there. So there are a lot of good examples that are happening locally and in our communities. Great. On that note, we'll open it to questions. Wonderful. For those who are uh, here in attendance in Houston, you're welcome to uh, form a line behind me. Uh, at this microphone. And for those who are watching online, you can ask your questions at texastribune.org slash ask. It's our Q&A portal, and you can uh, ask your questions there. I have a couple questions uh, regarding California. Um, this person writes, uh, my understanding is that California has, one, districts drawn by bipartisan committees, and two, nonpartisan primaries, i.e. both parties are shown to all voters. If this is correct, has this led to avoiding the polarizing effects of gerrymandering? Um, so California does have maps that are drawn through an independent commission that includes Democrats, Republicans, and independents, or people who don't associate with the two largest parties. Um, it has worked very well to um, um, create sort of um, more competition than you see in most states, um, Orange County, California is a prime example where uh, Democrats won a bunch of seats in 2018 to take back the House. Republicans won some of those back in 2020, and a bunch of them are very competitive now. Um, and you know, and they did that really not by trying to create competitive districts. They're not allowed to consider politics at all. They just sort of kept natural communities together. And the thing that turns out is that when you keep communities together, um, you know, there's a lot of it, natural um, competition. Um, and it also has been very good in the standpoint of these are competitive districts, you can't gerrymander them. So what did Republicans and Democrats do in these very diverse um, places in Orange County? They went out and recruited Latino candidates and Asian candidates and Republicans opened up outreach centers in the Asian community to try to engage voters because the, the idea was we can't suppress them. Um, so we're going to have to compete for those votes and that's completely different than a place like Texas where in Fort Bend County, a little um, west of here, 
um, also a very diverse county, much like Orange County in California, um, what Republicans did is they, they um, redrew the map to, to split um, Asian and other communities in Fort Bend County and draw in a bunch of rural white voters. Um, so rather than competing for the electorate of the future, um, they just sort of kick the can down the road. So um, California, I do think, is a, a really great model of how independent redistricting can work. California also does employ um, a, a top two primary. Everybody runs together, and then the top two um, go to a finish. Um, that is an early version of this. I think more modern or more more recent versions, I won't, won't say necessarily modern, are to have the, a top four primary where the, the top four finishers go uh, as in Alaska to, uh, uh, you know, a, a, um, uh, a, a all, all together primary and then they use ranked choice voting to determine. Um, and so that that is also a very, I think, encouraging reform. So I'm Jerome Wald and I serve on the early voting ballot board for Harris County. And I've been involved in politics since I was 14. I'm, I don't have to give all that history. What I want to address is, even though the word has been mentioned, is gerrymandering. And in particular, the astounding brilliance, though I despise it, of Karl Rove, who strategized taking over the court system in Texas and now and has developed into now three of the four people excuse me, three, three of the people, uh, of the four people who are now serving on the Supreme Court of the United States worked in the Florida election to defeat that vote and take over and help take over the country. And so I'd like you to address what I call it, the elephant in the room. Are you saying Karl Rove is the elephant in the room? <laughs> No, oh, but allowing him to become, you know, that we have not that, you know, I mean, so he's not currently doing it, but he set that in process and, and it wasn't resisted sufficiently so that we've got this um, bifurcation of what is actually, as I understand it, a minority of the population in control of the government of the United States. Yeah, well, Lisa didn't ask, Lisa asked us like what we gave us hope. I mean, I do think that the, the opposite question would be what worries us. And I do think that one thing that, that is a cause for worry are the courts, right? Which themselves have become increasingly um, at various levels political, or they seem to be more political and not calling balls and strikes as Chief Justice John Roberts likes to say. Um, so I do think, um, you know, the courts, particularly at the federal level are, um, a concern heading into the 2024 um, election just because, you know, these disputes get to them, they decide them on an emergency basis with very little briefing and, and oftentimes no argument. And, um, you know, they, um, you know, I think, you know, that that is a, a worry about how they, they come out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm well situated because I'm really not a judicial expert or watcher. I would say this is probably something that's gone on uh, a lot of people would say since the time when Democrats opposed Robert Bork in 86 when he was nominated and defeated and that we have been living uh, in this period afterwards where we've had more conflict over judicial appointments. Um, and, um, you know, my, my knowledge of this is, is, is not very deep, but that's kind of, it just looks like it's been going on for a while. I don't exactly know what stops it other than we try to find uh, as many independent jurists as we possibly can. Supreme Court term limit. Supreme Court term limit. Um, so again, encouraging our in-person audience, if you have any uh, questions uh, for our panel, um, I'll also, you know, with the few minutes we have remaining, Lisa, if, if you do have an additional question to round things out, I will mention, just so you can quickly gather your thoughts, um, we had some folks asking about being able to follow along uh, online with the program. Just a reminder that you can go to texastribune.org slash events and click on the symposium and that will give you the, the online schedule for the day. But uh, Lisa, if you want to go ahead. Sure. This is a bit far afield, but it's something that really interests me. I'm, uh, I love Jonathan Haidt. If you haven't read one of his books, um, 
righteous mind, the coddling of the American mind, they're really important, and they talk about why we think very differently on some issues based on uh, morals that we prioritize. Um, but I wonder if, talk about cancel culture a bit and how quickly we are to dismiss people because we view their view on something as immoral, evil, wrong, and suddenly they're off the Facebook feed or they're you know out of our lives. Um, every time I go home to Seguin, I see people I love more than anybody in the world, my parents, and we cannot talk about politics um, because anger ensues. But I believe their intent is, is pure. This is how they, they feel, and I should respect that. Um, intent. Have we forgotten? This is such a leading question. I'm sorry. <laughs> what role should intent play in dialogue? And if we don't consider it, what are the consequences? Yeah, and, and could you define intent a little bit more? Well, when we cancel somebody, we say, you have offended me. Um, I don't care if you intended to, but that consequence of the, the impact of offending me means you're canceled, you're out, you're bad. Yeah, no, I think, I think we need to have a lot of social tolerance. Uh, we need to have a lot of tolerance or different points of view and get to back to what I'm saying about is to listen to people, actively listen, be, have informed questions to ask them. I don't do this all the time. I'm just saying this is something we need to keep working on. I think it's something that's particularly important at the university level. Bipartisan Policy Center had a brief on this where they made the recommendation. I think it's a good one. Maybe this is something universities should have in their orientation classes for freshmen coming in, how to listen and how to have these skills that you can understand each other uh, with and hear each other and talk with each other without canceling each other. Um, a group called More in Common did a study called The Hidden Tribes, and it was a national study, and uh, it, it broke down groups of people in the United States separately from that kind of like bipartisan way and found seven, seven different groupings. And uh, in those seven groupings, the thing that brought them together, a thing that they could all agree on is that they all basically disliked cancel culture. But I think it is also important to understand where cancel culture comes from. And the reason that I say that is that, that I couldn't agree more with what Bill said of, of needing to have that sort of social tolerance and strength and the importance of that and being able to have conversations across difference and how that can lead to so much positive change. But I think um, that it's also important for us to remember that there are people who have felt so unheard for generations and uh, it intensifies, you know, that, that, that feeling, well, you know, I'll, I'll ask you, any, anybody got kids? I'll ask you nicely. I'll ask you nicely again. I'll ask you nicely a third time, but now just put on your shoes. <laughs> like we, we escalate, we escalate. And so I think that there is a part of cancel culture that is trying to remind us naturally, nationally that there are people who are hurting uh, and that we need not to forget that even as we ask for us to come together and listen to each other more. I'm not, nobody's coming with a cane in my neck. Okay. I wonder, there, there seemed to be such an interest in redistricting. So let's, Michael, um, do you see some kind of shift in the Supreme Court's thinking um, after Shelby v. Holder I have to say I was astonished at John Roberts saying racism, racism is over. <laughs> we don't need this part of the Voting Rights Act any. We don't need preclearance um, for states like Texas to, to approve uh, new redistricting maps. But we saw um, the Alabama decision. So what do you think? Um, I, 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 I think this is... I think race is an issue that the Supreme Court continues to struggle around, right? They issued the Alabama decision ordering Alabama to draw a second black congressional district. It only had one out of the seven before. Um, but the same term, it issued the affirmative action decision, right? Um, which took a very colorblind approach to the Constitution. And I think it's something that the court has has struggled with. Um, I will say, um, and you know, there's there's a cynical view about the Alabama decision that says like, oh well, like you know, like drawing majority districts, like there are only a few majority districts that you can sort of draw, especially if you don't get to like aggregate 
different groups together, like black and Latino and Asian voters together. Um, and so it really wasn't that big a deal. Um, and, and that's why the court did what it did. I, I don't know that I agree with that, but you know, that is sort of a, a view on that. I, I think ultimately it is incumbent on Congress to act. Um, and again, I go back to the fact that 40% of the population is in the South. 60% um, of black people in the country live in the South. Um, the fastest growing Latino and Asian communities are in the South. The South accounted for almost all of the country's population growth uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and the South has never sort of been able to do it without sort of a federal assist. There always has been a need for a federal assist and I think it will be um, necessary this time. So, you know, the, the courts are problematic, but Congress also can act by pa in passing, you know, a strengthened Voting Rights Act, other other reforms to require independent redistricting and the like. And I think, you know, that would go a long way. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. We've solved polarization. This is awesome. <laughs>